Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. I am very excited to be uh, talking to our guest today. I see him backstage, and if he gives me the okay sign, I will bring him up front. Let's see if he does it. There he goes. All right, thumbs up. Excellent. Really excited to talk about uh, several projects today with Steve Orlando. Steve, welcome back. Hey, what's going on? Doing all right, bud. How you been? Good. I'm trying to find my angle here. It's all right. I'm no like... Problem. There we go. I was ready to. I was ready. Oh, oh. What's that? I'm good. Everything is good. I was like a little confused on the time because I'm just generally an idiot, but I'm here. Uh, so we're all good. Well, you know, I screwed up last week. So thank you very much for understanding. Um, I had totally forgotten that we had scheduled uh, for last Tuesday. So I'm glad that we're doing it now. And uh, lots to talk about. You got some really great projects on the way. And I wanted to start with uh, a shared favorite of mine and yours. I'm more of a boxing guy, but I, I mean, uh, certainly MMA has its uh, appeal to me as well. And you a boxing uh, guy, you've never mentioned that, man. You kidding? We've talked about that. No, I know. You're, you're teasing me. Yes, I am. Yeah. All right, fair enough. Because honestly, I, there's a little bit of boxing news that I wanted to ask you about as well. Uh, I, mean, I probably i I've been so busy in July, I probably missed it. So we can you'll have to tell me about it, and then we can talk about it. But it's been it's been a really busy month. So like, I good. I've been, I mean, behind on everything except my deadlines. So I guess that's not the worst thing. <laughs> no, I understand, man. And uh, now you're a, you're a big gym rat. Are you able to work out during all this nonsense and everything? Have they opened up the gym? Uh, well, you can, you can probably see my exercise stuff right there. So now you can see I've never, I, I just don't leave my office ever. That's my solution. I understand, uh, man. It's been, I've been going a little crazy uh, exercising in my office um, now since March 13th. <laughs> but uh you know what that's all good uh we're holding it together it's probably keeping me sane good to hear man well we're here to talk about like i said you got several projects burning but one in particular is uh, your aftershock book coming up kill a man which uh you know is the mma world and um i see allusions to and i think we've talked about this before um there was a real world incident that I think mirrors some of the some of the plot of uh, of Kill a Man as well. Why don't you tell people give us the ten cent tour on uh, what they can expect from Kill a Man? Yeah, so Kill a Man uh, is uh, so first of all, John's right. We're partially inspired by Emil Griffith, who was uh, top ten boxer in the world in the sixties, uh, and and also happened to be a bisexual man. Uh, got called some slurs in the ring, uh, lost his cool as people can do. Uh, ended up killing the guy that he was fighting in the ring, and and in the decades. After that, you know, was lionized by a lot of people in the community, but at the same time, as he wrote in his book, was sort of haunted by the fact that he'd taken someone's life, righteously or not. Uh, and so we're inspired in part by that, uh, in part by the sort of underdog combat narratives you see in things like Warrior, uh, obviously things like Rocky and Creed. Uh, so the world of Kill Man, you have uh, 20 years ago, 
James Belly watched his father, DJ Belly, in the ring with Xavier Maine. His father's a bigot. Uh, he gets killed in the ring by Xavier Maine. Uh, flash forward to today, James Belly is like the Conor McGregor of the moment. He's up for the title shot. He's a shit talker. Uh, you know, basically just stealing Ric Flair's gimmick day and night. Uh, but he's got a secret. And the night before his title shot at press, his opponent, Derek Waldron, catfishes him and outs him uh, in front of the whole world. And so suddenly he loses everything. You know, his 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 entourage leaves him, his his crew leaves him, his trainers leave him, his title shot he gets taken away in a technicality, uh, and his own family abandons him because after all, how, how could he be one of those types of people? Those are the people that killed uh, his father. And so at his lowest, the only person he can turn to is the last person in the world that he ever wants to see again or talk to, uh, needless to say, learn from Xavier Maine, the person that killed his father. At, and by the way, the only person that can understand what he's going through. Yeah, man. No, it's, I, I think it's, uh, it's a story for its time. I mean, really, I, I think, uh, you know, it's something that, uh, like you said, catfishing, I mean, it's, it's out there. And again, I think uh, people still have, uh, you know, skewed opinions on, uh, on, uh, sexual orientation. So I think, that, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To say the least, I know I'm being, I'm being gingerly about this, but, uh, I mean, my no, friend thought I was a catfish when we met because he thought writing comics was glamorous. Little does he know, it's it's uh, incredibly mundane. Um, <laughs> but uh, well, so I'm uh, I'm bringing up the information because I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Tell me about uh, first of all, because you're, you're co-writing this with uh, Philip Kennedy Johnson. So tell me how the two of you got together to write this. Uh, well, I've known Phil for a long time. He's one of my good friends. We actually met uh, at a, com a Comic-Con in Albany uh, where uh, it, it happened that UFC was on. And this is how we found out when we first met that one of the first things we had in common, which would become one of many, was um, a love of mixed martial arts. And Phil was, you know, deep in it. He uh, He's an Army musician. He plays trumpet in the Army field band. Wow. Uh, and by the way, John, he wants to get on the show real bad. So let's, let's follow up after that. But no, Phil's already, his, his life is fascinating. So he marches for the army. He's an incredible trumpeter. He trains mixed martial arts. And then he's a comic book writer uh, and a big comic book fan, uh, in addition to being a composer. So we came to have a lot of common, but it all started with mixed martial arts. And it all, uh, it, it all started, well, and chicken wings. Uh, because we were in upstate New York. That's the real thing. We we went to this hotel and like Phil's from uh, his, uh, you know, he lives down by DC, and they had taken him to this place and the and, and the wings of this hotel were just insulting to me as someone from Central New York. So I was like, we got to get the fuck out of here. Uh, so I grabbed him and a bunch of other people, um, and we Isaac Goodhart uh, and Ryan Katie were actually both also there, guys that you might have had on or should have on. Isaac has um, been on absolutely, man. But uh, uh, yeah. We ended up eating like 120 wings and watching UFC and Phil and I became friends. So when I started telling about people about this book, I really realized that, you know, this, this is an incredibly important story to me. And it's an incredibly important story to a lot of people. And I'm a huge mixed martial arts fan, but I'm a huge coward. Uh, I will say with no irony, I've only been hit in the face three times and all three sucked. So <laughs> my world, you know, at all. Um, and, uh, I wanted, if we were going to tell this story, one that I really do think is important and also just so richly emotional, like important is a weird word to throw around because I feel like it kind of implies that you're sort of like, <laughs> you're like guilting people into reading it with a moral imperative and that's sort of horseshit. Uh, the, the, the key is it's just so richly emotional and intense is what I should say. And so if we were going to tell this, I wanted to make sure that there was authenticity, not just uh, in, in, the, in the queer side of the book, because I have, you know, a, Ask my exes, a lot of experience, probably more than I should in that world. So, uh, but I wanted the the combat sports side to be equally authentic because that's what folks deserve. If we have uh, mixed martial arts fans coming in that haven't read a bunch of comics, they deserve to feel welcome and validated in the same way that any of our queer readers do or any reader does. So, sure. uh, I needed it to be just as riveting, just as real as everything that I was writing about. And that's why we brought in Phil, because A, he's a great writer, and people are reading The Last God. It's a great, great book, among other things that he's done. Last day, uh, Warlords of Appalachia basically predicted uh, where we're at in the country right now, actually, a book he did at Boom a while ago. So wow. Phil is just super smart, a great writer. And uh, you know, when, when I went off contract with DC and went freelance, one of the things I wanted to do was more co-writing, because 
we can make each other better. You know, um, I, I've got my strengths and weaknesses. Phil's my strengths and weaknesses. Uh, excuse me, has his own strengths and weaknesses. And we get a product that is better than uh, any of us uh, would have done on our own. So I, I brought him in uh, not just to make sure that everything when it comes to the fight content is, is real and believable and authentic, but, uh, but to make sure, you know, just to have a different experience. You know, I wanted this to be a book that could be real and, and, and uh, relatable to everyone. And um, I think, you know, being bisexual and writing with a straight writer, like we know, uh, you know, I, I, plenty of times during the scripting, because what we would do, basically Phil would lead on the, on the fight content and I would lead on the emotional content. And then we'd revise each other. And there's plenty of times I was like, wow, there's way too much like talky fight porn here. You know, like, like you need like 50% as much because you're, we're going too far into things that are, we've gone beyond validating our, our, our combat sports readers and into alienating people who are not. Uh, and, and, and he will say the vice versa for me, you know, and, and it's extremely beneficial. I think we have a finely tuned and finely honed product that really, especially at the ending of the book, which you haven't seen yet because it's being drawn right now. There's no better story when it comes to co-writing and collaboration for me than the ending of the book, because Phil and I came in it with like, we literally wanted opposite things. And when we hashed it out and explained why we were both right, um, we found a way to do it all. And, and, and it's a stronger ending than either of us. I know that would have come up with on our own because we took our two endings and realized neither of these are good enough. Uh, and, and, and to me, that's the best part of collaboration. Like, yeah, we probably call each other, I mean, some names in between, but like, I was almost overwhelmed thinking about the ending of this book and I can't wait for everyone to see it. Um, and you know, we're both like stubborn idiots. Uh, so there's a lot of like, oh, if that works, why don't you fucking show me? And then we put it in the script and sure enough, he's, you know, me or Phil will be like, oh, that really does work. So Look, it's just the strongest thing I've ever done. Uh, it's, and there's nothing else like it I've ever done. There's basically nothing else like it in comics. There hasn't been a mixed martial arts book really since Heart. Uh, right, I was going to say, absolutely, which, yes. It was great, uh, which was great, but it was it was a minute ago, you know? Uh, absolutely. Sure. So um, I, I'm just super excited about it. And I should say it as well, Alec Morgan, who's drawing the book, um, also – practices mixed martial arts. So wow. you have, like you have from story to it's telling on the page, something that I think is the most authentic mixed martial arts product you can find. And from the queer side of things, like there are things that are talked about in this book that uh, I've never seen as a reader. There's things I wish I knew. There's things I wish I'd been told. And, and, and there's parts of, uh, you know, my experience and, and the group experience that I've never seen illuminated before. And the key is all, but behind all that is that, Anyone should be able to relate to that. We're doing it in a way that makes you care. Uh, you know, I no, ma no matter what background you're coming from, it, it, it validates me when I'm on queer podcasts that have never cared about mixed martial arts, and it validates me when I'm on mixed martial arts podcasts that are like, yeah, I was rude with this fucking guy, and I never thought I would be. You know, <laughs> like, it's, it, it's all very exciting to me. No, man, I think you guys achieved it. And I, all right, good, because I was going to say, I read, I read what you sent me, and I'm like, all right, is there another issue? What's going on? But you, yeah, you basically sent me like half the book, I'm guessing. Yeah, we leave you in a rough spot. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and we're shooting high. You know, I, I genuinely think, I'm sure you and I have talked about my obsession with the movie Creed. Because uh, to me, it's just the best movie of 2015 and one of the best movies I've ever seen. And, and it, not because it's about boxing, but because it, it's about more than that. It's about having uh, something that you need, that you just need to do. And, 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 you know, that no one else in your life understands. And for, for Donnie in that movie, it's boxing. But I sat there, again, a coward, a noted coward, uh, being like, I, I understand this guy. Because, yeah, I've never wanted to be a boxer or uh, a fighter, despite my immense respect for people to get in the ring. Um, but listen, I do a job that most of the world doesn't think is a job. And there's not a person in my life that didn't tell me to quit and give up over the 20 years it took me to break in. So I know what it's like to have everyone tell you that it's not going to happen and then you, it shouldn't happen and that you should just take the, take the safe route out. I know what that's like. And we all have something like that. So that sort of uh, cross vocational uh, aspirational type of story, that's what we're hoping for here. So even if you never get in a ring, uh, you know essentially what it's like to have to prove yourself 
uh, ultimately to yourself. And maybe it's about something completely different, but you understand that fight. To me, that's the magic of these combat sports narratives. Like, again, it all clicked for me in Creed even more than Rocky because look, like Donnie is my age-ish, uh, but Rocky is still Rocky in that movie, even though he's 60 to 70 years old, he's still going the distance. But now, much like his audience is age, going the distance means something different. Going the distance now means watching your friends die of natural causes or, or cancer or, or losing your wife. It means facing terminal or severe illness yourself and not giving up and staying in the ring. And it means something completely different than it did when he was the punchy guy in 1974? Five. Uh, five, five, six, um, yeah. You know, it means something completely different, but that character is timeless and that theme is timeless because he's still doing it. Uh, you know, it's just that he's been allowed to gracefully age with his audience. So that going the distance, fighting the fight narrative uh, to me was so important in this book. And we, we filter it through combat sports and we filter it through a slightly different message because, you know, being in the LGBTQ plus community is a little different. But uh, when you see the ending, when you, you know, we, we want to stack the odds against James because the payoff is so great uh, when you finally get there. And that's all you can do, you know, not to get too like philosophical on the Word Balloon podcast. But I kind of love specifically the Rocky movies and the fight narratives in general where he doesn't win because, you know, in a way that's supposed to sound inspirational and not morbid, you can never win in life. All you can do is go the distance, uh, you know, like. Time's the toughest opponent. He says that in that movie. And it's true. Like, we never get a belt and then live forever and it's okay. But we can keep fucking going as long as we can. Absolutely, man. No, and I, I think, uh, the, ironically, the speech that he gives in Rocky Balboa is one of the more powerful ones when he tells his son, hey, life is always going to beat you down to your knees. But the key is you got to get up and you got to keep moving forward. I, and that's true. And it's absolutely and – he, and he says that's how winning is done. And it's true. And, and you're right. And it isn't so much – like being number one, it is like being there and still, you know, giving your all and, and being able to stand there when it, when the battle's over and everything. And I, yeah, I agree with you, man. I, I absolutely mean, agree with it. To me, the movies that count in that series are basically Rocky, Rocky Balboa and Creed notable because the lead doesn't win in any of them. Spoilers yep. like for a 40 year old movie. But like, <laughs> because like, when, I'm like, I understand the appeal of him going out there and beating all of Russia. Uh, but like, <laughs> It's a different character to me. Like that's the difference. That's the difference between John McClane and Die Hard and John McClane and Die Hard Two. Like they're different people. Even people. the Rambo movies. I think First Blood is a really emotional movie that has a tragedy to it, and then it becomes the comic book in the subsequent. Oh, movies. it's insane! Like that whole movie is about how he doesn't want to do that shit anymore, and then Richard Crenna forces him to do that shit anymore. Richard Crenna is the villain of that movie. <laughs> what other yeah. do you want about? Iconic characters that I'm sure someone's going to say I'm a cuck for not liking. But, not uh, at all, man. You're killing me. That's fantastic. Anyway. Hilarious. No, you know, and hey, man, um, no, I'm, I'm really excited to read the rest of this. And I and I feel the authenticity in the writing and in the art. Al Al's coloring his own stuff as well as drawing? He is. Uh, he, he's coloring everything. Uh, I mean, he's just done an incredible job. And Jim Campbell is a killer on letters as well. Like, we're, Phil recommended him, so I'm going to put him over for that. Uh, but he's doing a great job. No man, it looks it looks great, and I think uh, I think it achieves what you guys are setting out to do without you know seeing seeing the ending there and everything. But uh, oh, it's <laughs> Henry Steve does the cooking. Fair enough, man. I like it. You're killing me, man. Uh, also, by the way, a couple comments uh, that I want to acknowledge early on. Um, let's see here. Here it is. Oh, should I be looking in the comments? Good, good lord. Oh my God! There's a lot of theirs. Yeah, I man. Oh you? yeah, don't, dude. I want to. Uh, absolutely, man. No, no, no. You know, I mean, hey, I, I you know, want to give the whole uh, experience. Yeah. So John V. Obviously, uh, giving some love to uh, Midnight and Apollo. I completely agree. And then I love this. Emmanuel asks, uh, "Why have there been no Electric Warrior? Tra why isn't there an Electric Warriors trade? It was a really underrated book." Oh, I well. completely agree, Steve. Well, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, look, this, the, the reality is, unfortunately, that, that, that sales on that didn't merit uh, a collected edition, so it was canceled, uh, the collected edition. But um, I, I, every time someone likes that book, it's really pleasing for me because it was a challenge to write. You know, It had to both like use all of DC lore but also be really welcoming to anyone uh, and create something totally new. So while there is no trade, and I'm bummed about that, 
secretly, there is there are six hard covers of Electric Warriors that I had made myself and sent to the creative team. So it's it's one of the rarest collected editions <laughs> on the planet. Um, but every time someone reads that and gets it, it's really validating to me because like that is a book that against all odds should have been the most impenetrable shit in the planet. So anytime people say that it's connected with them and it's the opposite, uh, really, really pleasing for me because I took it as a huge challenge. And when people do actually read it, it seems like we, we succeeded. Absolutely, man. No, I think you're covering this really interesting blank uh, period in, in or blank prior to you uh, taking over and everything in terms of, DC history between current continuity and the world of the Legion. And that's a big 500 year gap that, uh, you know, or in really, I mean, I'm sure, like you said, you could have gone further and then really gone even, you know, century to century before and after the period that you focused on, on, on the issues you were allowed to do. But well, I thought it was exciting as hell. And, and it was like, and it was a big challenge because I sat down with DC and they were like, Steve, make it like Overwatch. And I was like, have you played Overwatch? And they said, no. And I said, okay, so you just mean make it wildly successful. Uh, okay, well, let me, let me, as opposed to all the other books I've done, let me make this one the good idea. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was something, but, uh, but I'm really proud of that. And you know what? Like we got an octopus person fighting around, like, you know, I, I couldn't, that's probably my favorite thing. <laughs> Weirdly, the octopus people talking with their uh, skin color, their, their like pigmentation and stuff. One of my weirdest ideas. I'm very proud of it. So it's, it is, it's a really great um, sci-fi story that has its obvious ties to the DC universe. And um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I assume that people can still buy the, the issues. They can. Uh, can Comicsology and everything. Comicsology and, and, and you know the singles might still be orderable, but like so it's out there. Like it's not like you can't find it, but uh, right. you'll have to break into my house to get the the hardcover. <laughs> That's excellent. Well, back to Killer Man. Um, well, like you said, are you reaching out to MMA podcasts and and queer podcasts as well? Yeah, but we, yeah, we talked about that. We're just getting going on promotion because it's going to be out in October. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a big month for me in general. Um, Ooh. But uh, the uh, so yeah, we want to be on queer podcasts. We want to be on mixed martial arts sure. podcasts. Uh, you know the the support we've gotten from from booksellers and early buzz has been really good. Look, I, I mean it's 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 funny because everything you know every book is a tough sell until someone says yes to it, and then it's like oh why didn't I think of that? So you know, we we took uh, Kill a Man a lot of places, and then AfterShock embraced it, which I'm eternally thankful uh, of them for. And, you know, Phil and I have been saying this for a while, like, you guys are all fools uh, to, to, to be like, oh, sports, you know, sports don't sell. Well, nothing sells until you do a great version of it, and then it does. So, totally agree. Um, you know, knock on wood, knock on my not wood plastic desk, like, like the reception has been awesome so far, better than I would have expected, and, and <laughs> it's only half the book. Uh, so when people can see the whole thing, uh, which will be in October, uh, I'd like, I, I'm really excited. We're going to be everywhere. We want to be everywhere with it. Uh, you know, cause it's something we're all extremely proud of. That's awesome, man. You know, uh, it, it's, I, you know, people know from the fiction and the reality of boxing that there are certainly corrupt, uh, parties that involved in the, the, the promotion and the execution of the sport. And certainly wrestling is like that as well. And then mixed martial arts has its own interesting little flavor when it comes to that stuff as well. I, you know, and um, the, Daniel White is a, is a crazy person, you know. Like I, I really wish he would have gone through with Fight Island or whatever the fuck he was gonna do. Like, just oh, I thought he did it. I didn't watch. They they didn't do maybe it. He did, but it wasn't. I mean, we thought it was gonna be the fucking Kumite, okay? Like, and it was not. So yeah, I think he did. Like, it was technically on an island, but we wanted like we have we wanted Mortal Kombat. Like when you call something Fight Island, okay? Like flaming there, flaming tiki's in every corner. If you don't hire Carrie Tagawa to be down there like announcing it, like you're not doing it right. So. I agree. That's excellent, man. Is there any extreme sort of setting in uh, Kill a Man? I mean, I've seen the octagon and everything that you <laughs> guys. No, I mean the, the most extreme setting is is Philadelphia. So take that for for whatever for what you will. Uh, <laughs> uh, writing Terminal Market is probably the most extreme setting in that book, but. Um, <laughs> No, I mean it's it's not the type of book, you know. Like it's 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 a personal story. So, uh, well, listen, I go to some weird places, some other books, which I'm sure we'll talk about. 
Uh, but yeah, it's um, it felt like a book like I wanted to do something more grounded because yeah, I mean like I I love going in the strange idea direction and I'm doing that and I'm and I'm scratching that itch. But um, you know, we can do a lot of things. I mean, in addition to things we're talking about today, like since I went off contract, a big thing for me has been pushing myself in new directions. So you're going to see a horror book for, uh, for me. You're going to see uh, a YA fantasy book from me. You're going to see uh, like just a lot of stuff that you maybe wouldn't expect from Orlando because uh, you, you can't just be one thing. Uh, and, and that's a, that's a big part of 2020 and 2021 for me. Um, I want to answer. I see someone's asking about unexpected and defenders too. You're not wrong. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to be sort of inspired by, uh the defenders but the fun thing about that book is that it's just a team of relatively uh disparate heroes that sort of runs on tension so it was kind of a broad mandate um i would love to work on the defenders uh i, I like dr strange a lot but i probably uh like the more eclectic members of the defenders even more <laughs> so gargoyle and uh i actually love gargoyle like sure first one of the first books for whatever reasons i bought uh, not from back issues, but from a, a new release was this project called Supernaturals, which you might remember. And it was actually early uh, uh, Yvonne Hayes work with uh, Brian Polito. And it was Polito doing like Chaos Comics versions of Marvel standards. And he had Satana, Brother Voodoo, uh, Gargoyle, um, Ghost Rider, and Werewolf by Night. And there wow. was like non continuity, but. I love Gargoyle like since then, and and that's and, and that book's never been collected actually. You want to talk about a weird gem to hunt down? Uh, I would. I, I don't even have copies of it anymore. I hunt for it all the time, and the only place I can find it are, are you know sites that cannot be named that uh, are are not deploying it legally, and I would rather pay money for it. So I'm still waiting. But uh, I love Gargoyle. I love Nighthawk. Nighthawk uh, sure. So like yeah, and I also I, I think I might have said I also weirdly love the champions. Uh, sure, the and, original yeah. champions. Yeah, I love the current book too. Actually, uh, the team focused one, but yeah, the original. I, I like, like I don't know. There's a period of time where you had these, these, this X Men diaspora, uh, and uh, you know, way before the New Avengers era, and and I love that. I love that Angel was on that team. I love Beast on the Avengers. So like, I mean, my weird, my my Marvel dream book is is Wonder Man and Beast in a team book. So that's uh, great. Uh, you know, I love that friendship. So I, I would love to do that. Uh, and hopefully we get a chance to. That's beautiful, man. I love it. I think that's hilarious. Um, let's see here. Mark McGrath really enjoyed your work. Electric Warriors and Martian Manhunter are personal favorites. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Martian Manhunter uh, turned out quite nicely, I think. Thank and uh, Yeah. So tell me about uh, what, you know, it, it, walking away from the exclusive, obviously just the freedom to be able to pursue more things as you're describing future projects and stuff. Well, yeah, and you know, I liked. I, I'm incredibly grateful for the time I had at DC. I learned a lot about storytelling, and I'm still there. You know, I'll have some. I'll be doing the Wonder Woman annual in August. I have some things out in December uh, that haven't been announced yet. Um, but I also uh, want to not have to, in all the time, have a boss. You know, I want to be able to tell the stories that I want to tell, and not have to. Uh, worry about the needs of uh, the very necessary needs of of characters that are eighty years old and and a billion and billion dollar IPs. You know, um, there's a lot of rules. You know, the the more prominent a character is, as it should be or as it needs to be, I should say, uh, the more rules there are about what you can and can't do. And sometimes I just want to sit down and be creative and and tell the stories that I want to tell. So. It's not that one is better than the other, but I do want more of a balance, and that's kind of where we are now. Cool. Are you going to be part of that uh, DC fandom uh, thing that's uh, coming up? Uh, no. uh, I'm not, but like not for any like nefarious reason. There's just we're just sort of in a window of, of you know my Wonder Woman run is wrapping up. The stuff that I that's upcoming is not for a while, uh, and you know. Um, I don't really have any news, you know, to, to be frank, but I, but there will be news. Uh, you know, there will be news probably by the end of the year. Okay. That's cool. That's cool. And, um, you know, beyond uh, killer man, of course, you've got, uh, you got another great book and I'm, I'm right now I'm blanking on the title, but wait a minute. I got it here on, cause I was looking at the PDFs and everything <laughs> commanders in crisis. Um, Yes, my so so one of the big decisions I made uh, is that outside of Marvel in DC, I want to have my own sort of world where I can do what I want when it comes to like, superhero stuff. Yeah, 
Uh, and, and Commanders in Crisis is the start of that. Uh, it is where all of my, that world, the world of Commanders in Crisis, which is bigger than just those characters, is where all my superhero stuff that is not Marvel and DC is gonna live. Hopefully, you know, going forward. Uh, this is, uh, for people who like my work in Milk Wars, for people who like the Strangers issues, Stranger issues of Justice League of America, the creativity of Martian Manhunter, uh, this is exactly the type of stuff that I want to do now that I am freelance. It's, it, it's, it's a book that goes wild, it's a book that goes strange, and at the same time, like, it's a love letter to comics as they were, uh, a modern update of comics as they were when I was a kid, you know, which, uh, as, as Tom loves to say, I'm just trying to bring back 1997. Uh, and I wasn't even a kid in 1997, so fuck you, Tom. But, well, <laughs> uh, but I... But I do love that era. It was like it was an interesting and fascinating transitional era to me, where you had like big, bold, electric superhero storytelling, classic superheroes like Tom Rainey art on Stormwatch. Uh, but you had these wild, smart, progressive, innovative ideas at the same time, and it's also like Grant and Howard Porter on uh, on, on JLA. You have these like more experimental writers uh, getting these ideas across through the medium of of, of classic comics art and, and that's something i wanted to bring back that's cool man that's great are you are you doing this through image who are you doing this through uh yeah so commander's crisis is out in october uh it's out october 14th uh from image the initial run is going to be 12 issues uh which you know beginning middle and end uh and then we're going to you know hopefully we'll have stuff lined up for launch right after that once we see uh how everything is going there's tons of world that is built out of that series uh, but it's also complete, you know, it, it has, it has something to say, uh, but it's also just a wild superhero adventure. You know, I love those, you know, again, I, the, the energy of, of the Morris and Jalen, the energy of Bagley and music on Thunderbolts. Like I love no holds barred, uh, superheroics, uh, and I love pushing those ideas forward. Uh, because that's what those folks were doing back then. I feel like we sort of had a period in comics where we were looking backwards exclusively, um, and and we can't rely solely on nostalgia. We gotta we gotta mutate it. We gotta say something new with it. And and hopefully that's what's happening by the end of issue one and well the end of this whole series. I don't know how much you want to tell about the world that you've set up because as you say that that really does inform the characters and and the path these these heroes take. Are you saying there's a twist at the end of issue one? Like uh, a book. Well, that, even prior to that, I think, you, you know, uh, again. A book, I, a book I've noted is inspired by Thunderbolts might have a twist at the end of issue one. Got it. But uh, what I will say is this, the world of, uh, of Commanders of Crisis is one inspired by, inspired by the Marvel and DC multiverses because so much of that has informed my creative career, but it is different. In the world of Commanders in Crisis, these are the last survivors of the multiverse. Uh, crash landed on our earth uh, because as they find out um, something's wrong. Uh, all, all the other worlds in the multiverse have become so broken and so toxic uh, that reality as a living entity is turned on them like your body does when something, when, when there's an infection, uh, when you, when you get sepsis, uh, it's, it's released its antibodies and it's destroying, it's destroyed every other world within the multiverse because creation and civilization has become so broken and toxic that ever, all these different earths are being treated like tumors uh, inside this greater being and they're getting killed off. So the, the crisis command and commanders in crisis, these are heroes that are trying to make sure we can be good enough long enough so that we, the last world in existence, don't go the way of every other world ever, that we don't become so broken and so tense and so toxic that uh, reality says, well, we're better off without you here. Uh, and and it, it's harder than ever, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of secrets involved with that. The, the existence of the multiverse as the book begins is a secret because if we knew we were the last hope for sentient life, uh, you know, it might be so shocking that it would push us even further uh, towards, towards the end. So uh, basically we have to find a way to be better. Uh, these, are, these are heroes trying to help us find a way to be better to each other because they alone have the secret knowledge that if we're not, uh, we're all going to go down with the ship, uh, and we just can't let that happen. Who's your artist on uh, Crisis in Command? Uh, Commanders in Crisis is Commanders in Crisis. Uh, I apologize. Uh, it's Davide Tinto, uh, who's done work for Marvel Adventures. He's incredible. Again, we're going classic superheroes with the art. Uh, Davide came to me through Mirka Andolfo's studio in Rancia, who I've done a lot of work for. 
Uh, and he is just, he's an incredible designer. There's incredible energy to his work. Uh, and as the book gets closer, you'll see, you know, we are, we have incredible support uh, with our, with our cover program. Uh, we're going to have uh, icons doing our variants, uh, you know, that have been, I mean, some of this, this lists are out. So we have Step and Subject, we have, nice. we have Emanuela, we have Mirka doing a cover. Uh, we have, um, I mean, I'll spoil a couple uh, as well. Like in the future, we have Cully Hamner, or we have John Boy Myers doing a cover. We're doing a New Yorker cartoon inspired cover that is by oh, my friend who actually works for the New Yorker. Uh, cool. 3D modeled cover by a sculptor from DC Direct, Paul Harding. Uh, we're doing a lot of different things. Um, and then we're also featuring new voices, which is important to me too. So in addition to the iconics of creators we see in issue one, you're gonna have covers by Micah Souza, who's an up and coming uh, female of color. Uh, we're gonna have David Tulaski, who's a, who usually works in video games, doing our prize fighter cover, uh, uh, which is like a queer cheesecake cover that I'm very excited for. I've shown that one online. <laughs> We want to do. We want to be equal opportunity uh, with, with, you know, with our with our with our, our 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 cheesecake in this book when it exists in our cover programs. But we also just want to use this book again to push it forward. We want to celebrate the past, uh, and we want to also uh, push forward into the future. Uh, we want to show showcase new people. We want to do new types of work on these covers. So yeah, we have all of those icons working on issue one. Uh, as I said, like uh, you're going to see in solicits, but I'll say here, we got John Boy, we got Cully. Uh, we're, I, I, you know, if you watch me on Twitter, like you can see it happen. I believe we're going to have, uh, we're going to have Wada in the future. We're going to have uh, a dinosaur variant by Brett Booth. Like I, I want to have people doing the best type of thing they can do for this book. And it, and it has to be fun too. Like there's also going to be one, if not two uh, original cosplay covers, like things that I haven't. Oh, cool. So, hey, that's awesome, man. Cosplay cover, and we're working on a drag cover as well. So uh, <laughs> you know, I want to do different shit. There's no point in going to Image and stepping out of the box if you're just going to build the new fucking box for yourself. Uh, so, so that's what we are definitely not trying to do uh, with this book. Outstanding, Steve. That's that's terrific, man. And I really appreciate you giving me the preview of it and everything. I think uh, it looks it looks great. And um, I, I, man, I'm mean, honestly, it's it's about time. So why not, you know? Jeez. And also, I'll tell you, the crazy thing, like, you've seen in issue one, like, we have, um, you know, there it, it's not a highly political book, but there are political aspects in the book. And the crazy thing is, is, like, how do you even write something satirical uh, in, in 2020? I wrote, you know, the the bill <laughs> that is sort of on the docket, which, again, is our ode to, like, not just, like, the Watchmen era, uh, but also, like, the era of Justice Society where HUAC was after them. Uh, you know, like we want to, it's not going to be an oppressively political book, but, but I, as a, as a tip of the hat to sort of some of the icons of comic book storytelling, I do want that through line, like a, of sort of an apocalyptic bill being pushed through. And the funny thing about it is, is I wrote the first issue so far back and I was like, surely this is ridiculous enough that it'll seem like satire, but now what does that even mean? You know, like, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's the biggest challenge of today is writing something that seems unrealistic enough that you don't think that then you can tell that it's purposeful satire. Uh, because what would that be uh, right now? You know, so I hear you. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a challenge, but uh, at the same time, like hopefully we, we cut through in the right way with, with that, the, that portion of the book. Uh, Cause it's, it's a challenging time right now, but we, uh, we also, uh, as we talk about in the book, uh, like it or not, we are stuck together. So, so we got to find a way to work it out in real life as well. Absolutely. You're, you're always a big presence on social media and I'm glad that you are doing, uh, I'm sure you're doing more video podcasts and things. Did you, did you have a panel at uh, Comic-Con at home? No, I'm not just taking my shirt off on social media. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I had one for Comic-Con at home, but the book got pushed back actually. So I've like, oh. mostly been like a victim of scheduling. Um, uh, this summer, but uh, but you're gonna see a lot of news in the fall, so I wouldn't worry about that. That's cool. That's cool. And uh, yeah, man, I know you're not ready, but you you showed me uh, something really cool though, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in a couple months as well. Yes, I, I'm excited to uh, probably sooner than a couple months actually. With, okay. With the way with the way that company works, if you look at fast releases, uh, it could come anytime. Fair um, enough. But uh, but I'm mostly just setting up previews of that. I mean, that's no secret that I've been working on a lot of shit. You know, I tease stuff all the time on social now that I'm free. 
uh, and and it's a great time. You know, I tell everyone uh, I'm probably working three times as hard as when I was exclusive, but I'm one third as stressed. Good. Uh, that's great, man. You know, uh, and, and and that's kind of the dream, I guess. Like working twice as hard and not three times as hard would be the dream so that I could like, but then again, it's not like I can go to the fucking park or something right now. So I might as well make comments. That's good. No, I hear you. And and seriously, this has been the common theme really since the pandemic hit. How's everybody, how's everyone's creativity, creativity handling the restrictions? Is it, is it inspiring more work? Is it inhibiting? And everyone's got their own story about that. So it sounds like, you know, you're making it work for you, which is terrific. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I feel like a, a deer in the headlights this month and this summer because the, the pandemic hit and I sort of like, I sort of panicked and was like, oh fuck, I have to pitch everything everywhere. And then like, you know, knock on fake wood again, like a lot of it worked out and I, in July hit and I was like, oh, well, all of these books seem to have deadlines this month. Interesting. Um, how could that happen? Uh, but, uh, but it's going to be good. As I said, you're going to see a lot and, and, and different from me too. And, and the different is also what's most exciting to me because there's only so much you can do stylistically and thematically when you're on contract because there's just certain types of books um, that are published you know, by, by the big two. And that's again, not right or wrong, like they have their brand. But if I want to do a, like a weird food influence book, uh, it's not going to get over the plate uh, at Marvel or DC. But now if I want to do that, I can do it. I mean, I'm self-funding uh, a gay passion play uh, book for my birthday, which will be, I hopefully have some art to announce on the 14th for my birthday. Um, and, you know, again, uh, I'll talk about it a bit here because I haven't really talked about it. Like, it's going to be unlike anything else that, that you've seen uh, in comics. And, and I'm not doing like the Mark Millar, like, oh, it's going to be unlike anything you've seen, but it's just a rebranded version of a DC Comics character. Uh, you know, like, Wanted, definitely not the secret society of supervillains at all. But like, uh, you're killing me. I can only speak the truth, so um, <laughs> I'm not looking for a job in that area. So like, whatever. But um, no, like, we're doing the passions of Sergius and Bacchus, uh, who were saints who may have been, and in this book are a couple. Uh, they were martyred not for being gay, but for being Christians, because it was because because of the time frame. They were Roman soldiers. Uh, and, and we're going to try to present this in a way that hasn't really been tried in comics. We're going to try to present it as a widescreen comic strip uh, that I'm funding myself. So it's going to be with Chaz Truog, who I worked with in Octobriana way back. And we want to be inspired not just by uh, the constrictions, but also therein the sort of freedoms and forced innovation of a comic strip format, uh, but also uh, of the silent film era. So it's going to be an ode to oh, the, wow. the passion of Joan of Arc, which a lot of people think is the greatest silent film of all time. Uh, Storytelling wise, for folks who haven't seen it, it focuses almost entirely on her face and shoulders. And the most of the performance is emotional and with her expression. So it's a challenge. I mean, Chaz has a lot of rules on what he can and can't do, but at the end of the day, you're gonna get a book that each page is gonna open up into a double page spread and that double page spread will be a strip. So it's both, a, it, it's gonna be bigger and in greater detail than strips in the past. That's why we're calling it a widescreen comic strip. Uh, and then the coders are going to be traditional comics, but for the most part, again, it's just going to be, we're trying to do something totally new with the format. Uh, you know, I have three times as many rules as the Tom King comic. So love you, buddy. Uh, and like, and, but, but I'm doing it myself. That's my birthday gift to myself. We're going to, we're going to fund it. We're going to get it out there. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully people will be excited to see something totally different. And, and that's what we got to do right now. You know, again, why do the same fucking thing? There's a thousand people that want to do that. I hear you, man. I was wondering when you said widescreen, if it was like the early 2000s when they turned, you know, the, you know, the comic book. Yeah, but, you know, honestly, I appreciated that. I thought I it was interesting. There, but there's the question of whether utility was outweighed by the inconvenience in the reading experience. But, I, yes, I personally enjoyed it. And I, yeah. and I hope that they tried something new. I mean, remember uh, Steve Siegel did something like that with Mike Allred. It was called Vertical. Vertical. At Vertigo. And I do it, remember Vertical, absolutely. The whole book, the whole book read like that. Yes. So I have a copy. Siegel was my mentor, so I have a copy of it. But, you know, key to what I just said is how the fuck do I put that in a bookshelf? It doesn't fit anywhere. So, like, it's somewhere in my house. Uh, but. Yeah, I remember it was odd-sized. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. But, yeah. 
So when you say he was your mentor, was it like, did you work with him and everything? Uh, well, Steve met me when I was 12, first trying to break into comics, and basically spent the next 20 years uh, teaching me how to be a professional. Um, you might have mentioned this before, but keep going. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, every basically every year uh, I would come to San Diego Comic Con starting at age 12, and I would have a script or eventually a pitch and eventually a comic that I had done, and he would tell me what was unprofessional about it. Uh, and say, come back next year. And he would say, you know, if you're looking for praise, talk to your mom. I'm here to make you a professional. Because he's, you know, very utilitarian. I was like 12 years old. And he was like, well, kid, write every day. Because if you don't treat it like a job, it'll never be one. Bye. Uh, and, and that was our first meeting. Uh, but, you know, and he tells that to a lot of people. But the difference was I never stopped fucking coming back. And That's great. So uh, yeah, 16 years later, I was 28. And I gave him. Uh, the first ten pages of Undertow, and true to and we'd become. I mean, he's one of my best friends now. But we. That's awesome. And then, but true to his word, when I finally had something that was ready, he said, "Okay, what do you want to do with this?" And I said, "Oh, well, I'd love to publish an image." And he said, "Okay, here, read this," and handed it to the person next to him, who was Eric Stevenson. Um, and he read it, and I was approved in like a minute. You know, uh, sixteen years and a minute. But uh, I, almost everything I learned about conducting myself and, and the ins and outs of the business uh, and, and, and what is useful uh, when it comes to mentoring and critiquing others, I learned from Steve. Because he is, he is uh, I mean, metaphorically, he's never given a single hand job. Okay. You know, like you always know exactly what he thinks. But I find that incredibly useful, like, you know, and, and, and yeah, like he probably could be a little less utilitarian. I call him lovingly brusque, you know, but uh, at the same time, like, um, I've always known what to expect. I've always known what to be ready for. And, 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 and I, I value that incredibly. And I try to give that to people when they ask my opinion now. It's probably why some people think I'm a little mean. I'm not trying to be, but you don't need to hear why something is great uh, or that it's the best thing ever. Uh, you have people in your life for that, but if you're asking a pro for help, you want to know what could get better. And yeah, people shouldn't be mean about it. I try not to be, uh, but constructive is not mean. Honest is not mean. Uh, and if, and, and there are things that can always get better. There's things that get better about every professional creator's work. So there's certainly things that can get better about up and coming people's work. And, you know, sometimes it just seems shocking, but it's very simple for years. The thing that he would tell me when I would break him a pitch is, Okay, so you're pitching this to Image. Uh, does this look as good or better than every book Image is publishing right now? If not, why would they publish it? And that's Agreed. that's sort of devastating to hear. But it's also uh, when you when you've been working with him. But it's also true. Of course, you know? it's true. It's Absolutely, not, man. No, I'm I'm I follow that philosophy as well. When I when I mentor, and I try not to be too tough because I had a couple early experiences where people were like, "Hey, man, you know, dial it back a little bit." It's like, okay, but again, like you said, you're not there to hold their hand. You're there to help them get over the pro mistakes that well, there are non, non pro mistakes. I, in Siegel, I remember about 10 years ago, uh, not 10 years, six years ago, when I first got in, uh, someone asked me, uh, someone that Steve and I had both met the same person. And, uh, we both got an email from him and I like, and it was not the type of thing that you really ask someone, uh, and I wrote like a pretty honest, but three paragraph long email and, and in response. And I, uh, I called Siegel after, I was like, how are you dealing with this man? Like, it's like, how you got, we gotta like, let this person know that like emails like this are damaging their career uh, and they can't do them. And he was like, well, I just wrote back one sentence, never write an email like this again. And I was just like, fuck man. <laughs> like. But that's also true. Like so many times in my own, like I, anyone who's watched is going to think that like, this is like comics boot camp. but these are all true things. You know, I would, when I was 15 and when I was 18 and when I was 22 or what, I mean, and I would call Siegel and I would, you know, I would be done, you know, I'm quitting. Uh, this is too hard. It's never going to happen. Uh, and if you want to know why I am like I am, because he wouldn't suck my dick there. He would basically just say, you can quit any time. Good. And, Good, bud. Uh, yeah. And being stubborn, I was like, well, okay, fuck you too. I guess I'm not going to quit. But like, you know, you know that's that I, I owe a lot to him. Uh, that's the long version of that story. And uh, that's awesome. Like, 
I'm, I'm extremely lucky because uh, seeing a lot of seeing without talking about it too much, uh, I sort of tweeted about this, but it's a very true realization I had that uh, seeing how often that relationship has been taken advantage of by pieces of shit in comics in the past like four months and, and people who are speaking out against the, again, being taken advantage of or abused by people who don't respect that relationship. And those people are all trash. Uh, and I've said that at the time. Uh, it makes me realize how lucky I am that that wasn't the case with me, you know, like to have someone who stuck with me and encouraged me, even in his own RoboCop way, uh, him and Joe Kelly, I should say, everything that's true about Siegel is true about Joe Kelly, with the exception of the fact that Kelly smiles more and is nicer. Uh, <laughs> these are guys that have known me since I was 12 years old and had every chance just to, to break me down mentally and emotionally for their own enjoyment. God forbid, take advantage of me and, and, and so yeah. often, uh, and how naive I was about how often that can be abused. Those pieces, those people are all garbage. Uh, and, and it, and it has shown me how lucky I am or was so, and continue to be. Understood. Yeah. Agreed, bud. And you know, I always, uh, Steve, Steve is somebody that, uh, it was interesting. His wife, Lisa, and I had mutual friends here in Chicago when they were here in Chicago. And this is years before I started the podcast. And um, Liesl came in one day wearing one of those weird kind of uh, varsity DC jackets of the 90s. I'm like, where the hell did you get that? And she's like, oh, my husband writes for uh, DC. And I'm like, what does he write? And she's like, um, you ever hear of uh, Sandman Mystery Theater? I'm like, uh, yeah, I read it every month. Yes, absolutely. You know, I'm like, of course I did. So, yeah, I mean, it's so funny. Once I started doing the podcast and going to San Diego, by then they were on the West Coast. And I haven't seen Liesl. She would, probably wouldn't even remember me by name. But uh, actually, she's quite formidable. <laughs> she, well, that's the thing. No, I really appreciate. I, I spoke for her, to her class uh, in a radio capacity with uh, our mutual friend Susan, and um, yeah. So no, she was she was great. And yeah, no, just ever since then, it's like yeah. When I see Steven stuff, I'm always like, how's Lisa doing? That's great, you know, whatever. But no, he's he's terrific, and I agree with you, man. No, those men of action guys, they're they're incredible, really. Duncan and, and Casey too. I mean, they're just they're really smart guys. And I, I respect the hell out of the fact that they just stepped up and did their own thing. And goddamn, I mean, I just talked to Casey just a couple months ago. In fact, I'm due to, to talk, have him back and stuff. We want to do a book club for sex, those great books that he's doing for Image. I love that series. And it's just my own disorganization that's kept me from doing it. But no, I'm a, I'm a big fan. And also, like you said, Starenko was like that with a good artist friend of mine and gave him some really tough but honest criticism. And at first, my buddy was devastated by it. And I'm like, dude, you got to read between the lines. This guy gives a shit about you. He loves you. I'm like, he wants you to, to only get better. And I, and I, and I kind of helped him out. And he's like, okay, yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. Maybe that's true. And, and it's only been proven. And, and that's nice because, you know, Mr. Ranko being the, the artist icon that he is, you know, helps to hear. Uh, and I should say as well, like all those guys, I mean, Casey, I'll admit, Casey was the biggest thing to me. I've known him as long as I've known the other guys. And I think it took me 15 years to find out if he likes me or not. Um, <laughs> and and I did, but like, it was really like, it was, it was, it was questionable there for about a decade, you know? Uh, ten, I can five, relate. <laughs> five years to get him to take his sunglasses off. Uh, and then, and then another five to, to get him to blink in my presence. And then, and then I finally figured it out. No, you know what it was, is my book Virgil, uh, without talking out of school too much, uh, it got back to me that they were sort of considering not doing it. And it was Casey that had stepped in and said, no, you got to do this book. Oh, that's awesome. And, and then it won, you know, some, some best of lists for 2015 and things like that. And again, to be clear, I didn't even know Casey knew my name. That's how little we would, like, I would be at the booth and he'd be like, All right, like you make like, a grunting noise. And that's what, like, he's so aloof. Uh, but, but turns out he'd been on my side the whole time. So also, like, I want to put him over. Uh, both Joe's are great. Duncan is great. I mean, Duncan. Weirdly, I was obsessed with Fix, his X Factor character when we met. Like, I think I'm the biggest fan of that, of that, uh, <laughs> like, amazing telepath from, from Marvel. Uh, but, but Duncan is also incredible. Um, and being the, like, I'm definitely the most like Siegel, uh, so I feel like they all know how to handle me now in the same way that they all know how to handle him because Steve, like, is quirky. I am also, like, my, uh, my friend and I went out to dinner with, uh, with, with Siegel in New York, and Ashari had never met him before, and I guess he's, uh, they said something, 
And apparently from across the table, Steve and I both had the exact same both body motion and facial reaction. <laughs> In addition, and, and, they, and they were like stunned. They, like, they were like, you know, so I'm very much like him. And so it's funny to see the ways that the rest of the men of action guys all know sort of how to handle Steve. Because Steve, I mean, listen, uh, I only tell stories about him that I know he would admit to. So like, he's very well known for saying like, oh, if we're going somewhere and you're thinking about suggesting something, uh, here's just an important phrase to remember. Uh, I've already thought of that. <laughs> and, and like, you know, I'm like, okay, man. Uh, but, but it's funny to watch the other ones react. Like, uh, especially Duncan will be like, yeah, we all say, we all say, say that he's, you know, he's right. And then when he walks away, like, we actually make the decision. Yeah, and, and I'm just like, um, but it's but it's true. See, see, Steve and I are probably more alike than I could ever imagine. I've only won one argument in my entire life with him, uh, and I'm now let's see, I'm going to be 35, so I've known him for 23 years. So maybe for like my maybe for my birthday, you know, I can win a second one. There you go. Carl says uh, happy almost birthday. That's nice, yeah, Dave. It's a week from Friday. That's beautiful, man. Well, 35, child. That's good. That's all right, man. You're doing good. Uh, Dave Ryan has two comments. First of all, let's do a new Liberty Legion. Am I right? Isn't that the Marvel uh, 40s characters that was in Marvel 2-in-1 uh, and one in Invaders? One of them, yeah. They're the, I think they're the British one. I don't know, like because because the Invaders are the main ones, and then they had all Winter Squad. Right. And then Liberty Legion, I think Spirit of 76 was in that, and maybe the Red Eagle, but I'm actually not as up on Marvel Golden Age as I am DC Golden Age. But I, I weirdly was referencing Spirit of '76 in an unrelated uh, script today, so he's been on my mind. The the Marvels project that Brubaker did with I want to say Epting, I loved that series and just seeing all those great timely, you know, backup uh, heroes and stuff like the Angel and and. Uh, you know, yeah, Spirit of 76 and, you know, Patriot. I love I love the notion that Patriot and Spirit of 76 uh, explains how Captain America, where they still had Captain America stories after he's in the ice. I think that's terrific. And God, Carl Kiesel wrote that incredible miniseries about uh, Patriot trying to live up to, you know, being Steve without the super soldier formula and getting the shit kicked out of him a lot of times in the all winter squad. I think it was a terrific story. I think their golden age, for whatever reason, it's never caught on in the way that DC's has, but I do think it's extremely rich. Uh, and, and it's something I think has a ton of potential. Yeah. I love the Android Human Torch. Like, the, even the, the big three of the golden age are all awesome. Namor is awesome. Yes. Jim Hammond is awesome. And obviously, Captain America is probably my, I shouldn't say obviously, but Captain America is my favorite Marvel character. Uh, Me too. You know, uh, when he's, you know, when he's not written as a jingoistic idiot, because I don't think that's him. Well, sure. Yeah. Did you like Zdarsky's Invaders miniseries that just wrapped up? Uh, in full disclosure, I have been too deep in comics to read anything more than the first issue, but I like the first issue. So uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bullshit on that, but, but I did like the first issue. Look, man, I liked new Invaders. Okay. Me too. Me I've, too. Never, I've liked every Invaders book. Chuck uh, Austin's book. Absolutely. Yeah. And I actually think there's a, I was talking to someone, I think Celia about it. Like, I actually think that U.S. Agent is a fascinating character now because I do think that he's someone, even though he's, you know, with not, there's nothing wrong with it. He's farther to the right than me. Um, I do think that there's a story in his disillusionment to sort of like him finding out that he's kind of the, one of the only people that still actually believes in this shit anymore in an uncorrupted way and him having to come to terms with that. And I mean, based on my own father, who's always identified uh, as conservative, which again, you, everybody's got a right to be conservative, but he's watching, you know, he can't believe why certain things are happening because it doesn't actually match any of his values. Uh, and uh, and I think that would be really interesting in the case, you know, he's essentially the, with like the last, <laughs> the last libertarian uh, or, or whatever you want to call it. And that's a little dramatic, but I do think that there's something really interesting in, in that character right now. I agree. I absolutely agree. Here's another comment from Dave. I can see your talent early on, Steve. Love you, buddy. That's really nice. Uh, that's ridiculous, though. Dave's like 6'4". All he's ever seen is the top of my head. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. No, and I think regarding the timely uh, Golden Age versus the DC Golden Age, I, I mean, I, I can tell you growing up in the in the 70s, uh, you know, we we got all those great reprints. I mean, and and to be honest, those all-star, those old all-star all-star stories, 
you know, they they weren't the greatest stories in the world, but just those those costumes were so vivid. And, you know, I, I don't know. There was just something about the Justice Society that, you know, got me in those 100-page spectaculars they used oh, to put yeah. out. You know, so so that was the thing. And I think maybe if we had gotten those a, equally on the on the Marvel side. But I was a massive Invaders fan with Roy Thomas and Frank Robbins. I love that series. In fact, literally this week, because I have Marvel Unlimited, I was reading old uh, Invaders issues. I just adore that shit. And also just that dynamic, like you said, between the original three, um, that they c- that Jim Hammond and Cap can go to Namor and go, hey, cut the shit. You know, we 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 went through Alan World War II. We know you better than anybody else in the Marvel Universe. And can get in his face and be like, hey, man, you, if you can't talk to us, who can you talk to? And that was really kind of the crux of, uh, of Chip's Invader series, which I thought was a, a great idea. I mean, certainly with the usual bomb, bombastic superhero action and everything. But it was, yeah, I love that stuff. I mean, I was really sad that the JSA were basically off the table while I was at DC. Uh, so I'm hoping I get a chance to get back there because those were my those are those are, I mean those are my characters you know like for and, it, and it's interesting to, to think about the fact that me uh, I mean the Robinson Goyer which was mm-hmm. by Jeff JSA series um, actually for for me going back further the Struzuski Parabek series from the oh 90s. yeah absolutely for the 90s me uh, too man I was it's bizarre to think that when I was super young, I should have been loving like Tim Drake. And, and I mean, don't strike me dead, Tynan. Like I like I like Tim Drake, but like <laughs> uh, I I don't know why I was so obsessed with these characters who were like eighty years old. Uh, but but I was, you know, I loved. I mean, Alan Scott was and is my favorite Green Lantern. I mean, I got well, he's in I'm my, the same somewhere in the same way. I absolutely adore Alan Scott. And I'll even hey man, I'll even confess when James took him to earth two and they made that Alan Scott gay. I'm like, well, can you introduce a, a different gay green lantern? That said, I swear to God, Steve, when the hundred page spectacular came out with the 80th anniversary, huh? Now you like it because tiny- it's what well, James, uh, because my feeling was, and I, cause really, man, I, I really wanted out there that like, at first I did have my problems with it and it wasn't any, at least on my, in my feeling, it wasn't an anti-gay thing. It was just, why are you turning Alan Scott gay? But now I think it's incredibly intriguing because my my feeling was, okay, what happens to Jade and Obsidian, his kids? And did he lead that life that produced those children? And if the answer is yes, that is fascinating. And wow, isn't that interesting to truly explore a hero that had to be closeted during his prime of the 40s and stuff and now can be the person that he is but also, you know, accept the the actions of his life, and that you know, and and again, and if he's bisexual or whatever, I'm like, that's great. I think that's really, really interesting. And I, I, there's a lot of stories there. You're right. Tell uh, seriously, I'm not an asshole having that well, that reaction. Please. I think a lot of people spent their life thinking that he was Paul Newman, and it turns out that he's just been Tab Hunter the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, um, That's cool. So. But I, 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 I love those. I mean, and I would love a chance to work the Marvel Golden Age. I love, I love like the. I mean, I, weirdly, like I've always loved Destroyer, and then I think they did say that Aubrey was gay at one point, which is, I mean, it's a bonus for me, I guess, to be. I didn't to, know that. But, but uh, I think that was after Aubrey had become Citizen V uh, at one point, but. But I love Destroyer. Uh, I love Blazing Skull. I mean, sure. I love Original Vision. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I, I hope that there's a chance to work with those characters because there's a lot of potential there. And again, like I just love Cap. Like I, few things. Uh, there's few things that I will cheer for every single time it appears in a comic. Uh, almost none, because at this point I'm like, you know, what else? You know, what can we say again and again and rehash again and again? You know, like. Uh, is Wolverine the best he is in what he does and is what he does not pretty, you know, but, um, but every time Cap says he's loyal to nothing except the dream, I will, I, I will explode like, like to me, cause it's so simple. Agreed. Um, uh, that was the word I was going to use. Agreed. But it's so true, you know, like, like, and, and, and in my opinion, you know, that too into it, it's so American 
as a country that was built on questioning authority to the fact that Cap should only really be loyal to the idea. So, I mean, I love that character, hopefully someday. Um, and even great. People who I, even people who I've dunked on, and, and oftentimes in my opinion, dunked on in this podcast, and oftentimes in my opinion don't get it. Uh, and I, my opinion is just one opinion. Um, you know, like a book like Civil War, which I, in, my, in many cases, just wasn't really my thing. The moment where Cap is mostly annoyed, not because he has to put on a new disguise or anything, but he, you know, he was supposed to be playing baseball with some kid from Make a Witch. Like that's him. You know, he he cares about individual people. To me, he is sort of like the goodness of Superman with the inherent threat and relative mortality of Batman, uh, and that's extremely compelling. I like it. That's fantastic, man. I loved your, uh, and I know we briefly discussed him in the past, uh, mentioning other Golden Age characters. Well, pre Golden Age, really. Uh, the Shadow. I loved your uh, crossovers with uh, Batman and the Shadow. Love um, the Shadow. Well, the Shadow is. I would love to work on him again. The Shadow is my favorite character. Uh, you know, I've had my favorite DC character, my favorite Marvel character. But the Shadow is my favorite character, probably because I myself, though I aspire to compassion, uh, am kind of an asshole. Uh, and the shadow is kind of an asshole. Absolutely he, is. He, he likes my favorite Batman stories, like the great Dan Waters, John Paul Leone story from Batman secret files or like the Batman planetary anywhere, you know, these times you see Batman not be this, this cold, angry man, but essentially an adult, you know, a man who's lost his parents and show compassion, you know, to, to criminals or people on the rock who made bad decisions. Uh, the shadow would never do that, you know, like he, because ultimately like he is about punishment, not justice. And he has the thing that Batman doesn't have where, because he has telepathy, he's a little more sure who really deserves punishment and not. But at the same time, like there's this very primal catharsis in him that I just think is so raw and real because he makes the people that make us afraid, afraid uh, and enjoys yeah. it. And, yeah, and and even in that '94 movie, which had some real low points, like there are some times uh, that I think are very much him. I agree. You I know, agree. When he drives Tim Curry insane, he doesn't have to do that. He wants to because he is is an asshole. And in the beginning too, like how does a movie switch tones so quickly all the time? But I I actually love the opening of that movie. You know, like like the the Tolku saying, you know, him like. Him being a privileged white guy, thinking that he's already in hell because he's been beaten up a little bit, but he has no idea. Like, what a great lead in. Uh, and, and, and there's not a lot else, I think, that really connects there. It's a little too goofy, but there are some things that I really love. And I love, so, I mean, I've got the full collections of the Helfer and, and, Ch and Chaken series. Like, it's just like, oh, he does have one other line, a couple other lines that I think are really good in that that show what's so unique to him. And again, like, it's a little weird. It's a little dark. You know, he saves Roy Tam. He says, I saved your life. Now it belongs to me. Like, he's not yeah. a good dude. No. Uh, no, a lot of the agents, that's yeah. exactly it. It's you owe me and you owe me forever. That's why I wrote Margo like I did in Batman Shadow. Like, she's the only person that doesn't buy his bullshit. Uh, you know, she's 107 years old. She's lived completely on vodka for the past 30 years. And I don't know, like, I don't, I try not to like auto fillet on podcasts too much, but I'm really proud of that book. Uh, mostly because of, you know, what, it, you know, like people who read it had never met the shadow before and they got him. Like, you know, the Joker shows up and Margaret doesn't give a shit about the Joker. She knows someone three times as bad, you know? Exactly. Uh, uh, that just happens to be on the side of good, quote unquote, even though he's, a, he's, he's not a good person himself. I don't know. Mm -hmm. like, I, some things I write, I can't go back and look at and smile, but I can with that book a lot. Uh, you know, even when he's saying she's right, when, even when he's saying Margo's right, he still has to be a dick about it. Absolutely. You know? No, absolutely. I loved in the 70s one of Danny O'Neill's uh, Shadow Batman stories where it went, it was a flashback of Bruce as a kid and the Shadow saves the Waynes in a jewelry store robbery and stuff. And then later they, uh, I think it's called like No Hope in Crime Alley or something like that. And at the end of the story, uh, the shadow tries to give Bruce uh, his 45s. And he's like, yeah, no, 
that's not <laughs> it's not my way. And it's said in that Bronze Age kind of little simpler, you know, storytelling, but the characters come through and and the contrast comes through. And it's just yeah, like you said, no, the shadow the shadows of force of nature and of pure evil and and yeah, and the world of of vengeance. And uh, you know, God, there should have been a shadow specter. Like a Jim Corrigan shadow story, I think would have been interesting. Well, I mean, yeah. And the funny thing is, DC kind of had that with Ghost Fox Killer, a character that Grant uh, made up uh, for the Super Young team uh, during the Final Crisis era. But yeah, I mean, and also sort of like Jeff's Crimson Avenger. Like, clearly, there's a connection there. Um, but I love the Spectre too. I mean, for the same reason, that Jim Corrigan is—he's uh, tortured. You know, I, I think I honestly like I, again. This is not news. I've given this opinion before, but Ostrander Mandrake on Spectre that is an unsung classic. It needs to be given every absolute edition that like like the the other icons of the '90s have been given. That book is incredible. It interrogates Christianity and religion and 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 also, but also guilt and 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 good and evil in a way that is just. The best thing Ostrander's already or ever done in a career that, by and large, to me is vastly underrated. Dude, uh, I am I am so with you. I I say that to John all the time. One of my favorite early memories in in two thousand six at that first New York Comic Con that Reed did. Um, I was with John and we were going over to Brian Bendis's table, and John John John's just the nicest guy in the world. And and it's like, oh, he's busy. I you know I don't want to bother him. I'm like. John, you are John Ostrander. I'm like, go over there. I'm like, I am telling you, I know for a fact, this generation loves your stuff and would be so thrilled to meet you. And and they did. And I mean, Brian, of course, loves John's work, gushed all over him, shook his, he's like, oh, I'm so glad you came over. And we walked back and John's like, I'm so glad you told me to do that. I'm like, dude, you're goddamn John Ostrander. You don't understand. All these people love you. What you're saying is no bullshit. I might have, if this came up before, I might have told you, but like we were at the world premiere of Suicide Squad and John was there and it was the same shit you're talking about. Like Viola Davis was there and the stars all had like little like security cordons, even though they were like in the same party as us, like, you know, can't talk to little people. I'm hip. Yeah, uh, I've been to those parties. <laughs> and so, but he wanted to meet her because like it was, you know, she was fucking his greatest creation brought to life. Absolutely. And but it was the same shit you're talking about. He's like, no, I don't know. Uh, so I got him through security to go meet her because uh, I was like, this is the guy's like she wouldn't fucking be here uh, playing this character uh, right. if not for you know if not for John. So like I uh, I I he I echo that story uh, and I mean I didn't even get through to talk to her, but it doesn't matter. I, I'm glad he could get through. John is incredible, and by the way, Tom and Jan also some of the nicest people in comics. Oh, absolutely, yes, indeed. Mandrake and Dorsma, absolutely. I'm happy that I've gotten to work with both of them professionally now, but the, uh, they are both also people that I met the same year that I met Kelly and Siegel uh, at, at Wizard World Chicago. So it's it's been uh, known them for a long, long time too. That's awesome, man. No, I I completely I'm with you. I'm absolutely with you. Really happy how Ostrander and Mandrake were able to end the Spectre on their own terms. I completely agree with that. And uh, and uh, Chad says can't wait to read Kill a Man, which is great. And yeah, Chad's a Chad's a big MMA and uh, and uh, fight fan, so that uh, no, I can tell you, man, it's it's very authentic. So that's that's terrific. And uh, yeah, dude, I'm I'm thrilled with what's going on with you. And I liked uh, the tangents uh, we've done. Uh, anything? Oh, I was going to tell you. So uh, you may not have heard it, but I think it might have crossed your your uh, your your point of view. Uh, Tyson and Roy Jones, uh, the exhibition that they've announced. Have you heard about that? Oh God, no! So I, I I'm not surprised uh, because you know Tyson did his little comeback to wrestling as cross promo, which was terrible. Uh, and yes, he, I agree. And he posted that video of him boxing, which is horrifying. Uh, like, why is it horrifying? Tell me. He's still fast as fuck. For what is he? Fifty six years old. He, uh, he's fifty four, and yeah, well, but Steve, as someone you know, and and I'll I'll talk to others about this that know know the sport. Um, I'm not yeah, sure. that was a really impressive like 30 seconds of video, but like I keep saying, the mitts don't hit back. No, so uh, yes, but I mean, and you're absolutely right. It's not the same thing, but it's still like Oh, he looked great. Um the wrestling thing was rough, and it's funny because his previous angle in wrestling was great. Uh but you know, it just he was younger. 
he was younger and it seemed painful now. And, you know, he they let him hit someone. Like the crazy the crazy thing about his angle in the night in ninety six, I think, for WrestleMania is that it ended with Shawn Michaels taking even if it was a pulled punch, he still had to take a punch from Mike Tyson in nineteen ninety six. Which I hope he got a million dollars. Yeah, no shit. Uh, I agree with that. Like but um I had not seen that. I mean, the last boxing I watched was that Tyson Fury boxing match. Uh, Where he dismantled Deontay Wilder? Yes. And I think that's what happened. I also had taken a significant edible. So, like, I was, uh, you know, more than expected. In Massachusetts, by the way, before, you know, before the, uh, you know, we're, we're legal in Mass. So. Don't worry, bud. We're legal here in uh, Illinois. So, it's all right. We're having a legal conversation. It's but, uh, but I was like, I think he did. But I, I don't even know what's real with that match. But that's Oh, man. I think I watched that. The last things I think I watched were, um, I mean, every, uh, yeah, I, I, I watched that. I watched the, whatever the last um, MMA with uh, with Amanda on it was. I watched her win again. Okay. And become and make history. You know, she's the only person to successfully defend a double title. Um, but like before that, I think. Uh, Oh my gosh! Did you happen to watch the UFC with with uh, with Joanna Drzejczyk and Zhang Wei Li? No, I I'm going to show you something in the private chat. Uh, okay, because the I mean, Joanna lost, but she is a legend to me for the beating she took. She she went the distance, um, but like the the beating she took from Zhang Wei Li was unreal. Okay. And I, I've never, I mean, to me, like, she, she's, a, she's a champ forever for, for like, fighting through this match. Um, I'm trying to, can I put pictures into the, into the private chat? I don't know if you can, but, uh, you know, some seriously, we can, uh, we can talk after, after we wrap up and stuff and you could show me stuff. Oh, no, I've got, I've got a fucking New York Post article right here. Hold on. Okay. No I problem. Knew, yeah. You can send me a link. Certainly. I knew it wouldn't take long. Um, no problem. But it's unreal. I've never seen anything like it. I can't believe uh, that she powered through that. Um, so, I mean, that was incredible. It's probably one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. That's cool. All right. I see it in the chat. So, we'll, we'll you know, I'll, I, will, I will check it out uh, post uh, our conversation. I The only thing about the – real fast about the uh, Tyson Jones thing, in both guys' cases, I want to see where their legs are because that's – that's the first thing to go. Hell, when Conor McGregor and uh, Mayweather were fighting, Floyd was walking around the ring like a 40-year-old man. He looked every inch of his age yeah, it, when it came to his legs. That. Yeah, I'm still always going to win that, though. Like, I, By the way, I have no, you know, this kind of a win-win for me. Like, I, either one of them getting their ass kicked would have pleased me. I don't uh, disagree. <laughs> but, you know, Connor was fighting whoever has more rules that they're not used to was always going to win that. Like, you know, if Floyd got in the mixed martial arts ring, he would have got his, he would have hundred percent. So like, as much as I hate to admit it, cause Conor McGregor has said some crazy racist and homophobic shit in his life. Like yeah, yeah. respect to him for lasting as long as he did, because he was basically fighting with not a hand tied behind his back, but both his legs tied behind his back, which is used to being able to use, you know? So, uh, um, no, I agree. Well, and that's but, another thing that, I guess the rumors out there that Pacquiao wants to fight Connor, and I'm like, don't do that, please I, don't do that. Pacquiao, I think Pacquiao and his homophobic ass should fight Dave Batista. We could and, watch, get squashed like a fucking tuna can. Yeah, that dis and that disappoints me too because from an athletic standpoint, I'm I was pleased, and I and hopefully if it was it might have been before or after his homophobic comments, but um. The fact that he's still able to compete at 40 and has done as well as he's done with top welterweights, it reminds me of Ray Robinson when Ray yeah, Robinson was yeah, in his I, 40s and still competitive. If he kept his mouth shut, I would have a lot better things. To I say. completely agree. You know, I have my biases, as you might imagine. Well, yeah, but dude, it, you know, it's the fucking 21st century. It, it, don't be an, it's that simple. Don't be an asshole. I mean, it, good Lord. And I'm, it, it, it's, there's all, as we know, and we could spend another hour talking about the disappointing people in pop culture that can't keep their mouths shut or aren't evolved enough to recognize that times it's it's about and not it's not that times have changed. It's about time that we start re, you know respecting people. But so. Big Dave is not one of them. God 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 love Batista for being like a a six four you know infinitely dense tank of a human. Uh, 
son son of a lesbian mother who will just shoot on anybody at a moment's notice. Like it, his Twitter feed is really something. <laughs> um, I was hoping he was going to end up fighting Ted Cruz. That would have really pleased me. <laughs> Jesus. All right, man. Well, uh, so when when is Commanders in Crisis? When does that uh, debut? Well, the convenient thing is everything we're talking about is out in October. Uh, okay, great. Commanders in Crisis is out in October. Kill a Man is out in October. Uh, I'm, I'm God knows I might have other stuff out in October that uh, I don't even know about yet because this is the world right now. Uh, we don't know when anything's coming out, but I know those two things are coming out. And um, Kill a Man, OGN, 124 pages, uh, one of the best things I've ever done. Commanders in Crisis. 24 page issues, 12 issues. We're going to be on time. We're going to make everything. We're way ahead already. And uh, two different flavors of my life, two different flavors of Orlando, but both things that are pretty wild and, and two of the proudest works I've done in my career. Uh, and, and in Command as a Crisis, you're getting on board with something that's just going to get bigger and more exciting as, as time goes on. This is the start of a world, uh, something I've been waiting for, well, as of next Friday for 35 years. So. That's outstanding, man. Seriously, it's all it's it sounds incredible, and I I appreciate you sharing with me as you have for these years now that we've uh, had these conversations. And looking forward to our next one, man. So, Kill a Man from Aftershock and Commanders in Crisis coming in uh, from Image all in October. Oh, wait, okay, a couple couple last comments here, Steve. I hope you're both good. Finally caught a live word balloon. Just read up on what Kill a Man is about. Very interesting. Love Steve's Midnighter book. Thank you, Adam. And Ed, it's all old man. I see his is Tyson and Jones. It's all an old man, large glove, respectable pillow fight until Tyson hears cuss in the back of his mind. He flips the switch. He won't need 30 seconds. Thinking 99% chance it's a joke. Well, I, I Ed, I think it, I think you're right. I think actually, I think Mike is going to be very mindful of the fact that it's an exhibition and that it's going to be eight rounds. And I don't think he's there to embarrass Roy. And I and I and I think they'll they might mix it up, but I I I I don't know. Personally, I think Tyson does have enough control to uh, to to keep the boom uh, away, but we'll see. It'll be interesting. And uh, yeah, I, don't know. I mean, Roy's got his bell run a lot a lot at the end of his career, you know. So there you go. Some final words of boxing, but uh, <laughs> wanted to make sure we got all of our uh, our quotes in. So Steve, thanks a lot for coming on, and uh, and as always, all the best, man. And I uh, I hope to see you sooner than later. I'll be here. You know where to find me. Thank you very much. All right, hang out because we'll talk a little bit post uh, post wrap up here. You got it, Steve Orlando. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for watching Word Balloon Live. Uh, I'm recording something tomorrow. I'm not going to release it for a couple weeks. Um, I can, t I guess, I can tell you, Joe Henderson and I are going to record something for Lucifer. You know, it's uh, coming back on Netflix. Uh, he was kind enough to uh, send me the season in advance. We're going to have a great conversation, and we will present it after the series drops. So uh, binge. And then uh, enjoy uh, my conversation with Joe about uh, season five of Lucifer. Thursday night, it's going to be me and Gabe Hardman uh, talking about uh, the first season of The Outer Limits. Twilight Zone gets a ton of love. The original Outer Limits, uh, not as much, and, and definitely deservedly so. Lots of great stories, lots of great acting, great early 60s television that uh, if you're not aware of, it's on Amazon Prime, and you can binge it if you have Amazon Prime, and watch it with us as we rewatch. Uh, the first season. I'm hoping to even do the second season as well. There are only 49 episodes of Outer Limits. They, it got killed midway through the second season. So that's on Thursday. So Word Balloon Live coming back Thursday night. I hope you'll join me then. And as always, thank you for joining me tonight. Good questions, everybody. Uh, as I always say to wrap up every show, stay safe, 